So it's been said that um, a healthy church is a community of Jesus followers with a shared vision, a thriving ministry, and trusted leadership. And when a person becomes a true believer in Jesus Christ, he doesn't just join a local church because it's a good habit for growing in personal spiritual maturity, although that does happen. He joins a local church because it's the expression of what Christ made him. And that is part of a living community, living in harmony with other believers as a member of the body of Christ. Now, a healthy church is not a perfect church. It hasn't got everything figured out. Rather, a healthy church continually strives to take God's side in the battle against ungodly desires and, and the deceits that come from this world, our own fleshly desires, and the temptations that come at us from our enemy, the devil and his demons. It's a church that continually seeks to conform itself to living out God's Word, to being hearers of the Word, but also doers. Friend, the church finds its life as it listens to the Word of God. It finds its purpose as it lives out and it displays the Word of God in everyday behaviors. The church's job is to listen to God's Word and then to apply it in all the ways that God has put before us to walk. And as many of you are aware, the stories that we see in the Scriptures, in the Bible, they teach us spiritual lessons by speaking to us through physical circumstances that people have lived through, who've gone before us. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, men chosen by God to pen what He wanted to say to us, those, those, those things have been placed there, not just to tickle our ears, but to help us, to change us, to reform us, and to set us on a course uh, that would glorify our God. And the book of Acts is the story of how God established the early church. And it was penned under the inspiration of the Spirit for good reasons. And I believe that the book of Acts gives us many templates to look at and to consider and to, and to pray over and to say, God, how would you want us in this 21st century to, to walk? Now, when I'm talking about the church, I'm not just talking about a building. I'm not talking about an institution. This place is great where we can gather together. But that's not the church. I'm speaking about the people that Jesus Christ has saved by grace through faith. When the Bible speaks of church, it clearly speaks about God's people. A gathering of genuine believers in Jesus that meet together in a certain city or town. Now, in the book of Acts, different churches are mentioned, but one of the churches that is mentioned stands out, and, and it rose to prominence in what is now modern-day Syria, and it is the ancient city in the ancient city of Antioch. Now, the Antioch church was first started after Stephen uh, was martyred in Jerusalem. The first uh, documented Christian martyr, Stephen, um, when, when he was killed for his faith, they threw stones at him until he died. Once that happened, a great persecution broke out against Christians in Jerusalem. And it scattered the believers to the four corners of their world. All the Christians fled for their lives. But you see, God had a purpose in all that. And would you follow with me in the story here, in the book of Acts, chapter 11, we're going to start with book, uh, chapter 11, reading from verses 19 to 21, and our text 
is Acts 11, 19 to 26, and Acts 13, 1 to 3. So Syrian Antioch was founded in the 3rd century by Greek Emperor Antiochus I, or the second, we're not sure. And Greece had overtaken this Persian Empire that had ruled the world. And prior to Antioch becoming a Roman colony in 25 BC, 2,000 Jewish people were brought to the city by the Greek Emperor Antiochus III to supplement the Greek population that was living there. And Antioch grew. And once taken over by Augustus Caesar, it became the administrative capital for the Roman province of Syria. And at its peak, at the, at its peak around the time of the setting of this book here, Antioch had a population of approximately half a million people. And for that time, that was a very large place. It was a retirement community for Roman soldiers, well known for its immoral uh, living and wild living. And it was considered the third most important city in the empire. Only Rome and Alexandria were more prominent than Antioch. So Antioch had this vibrant, blended culture consisting of Greek, Jewish, and Roman people, making it very uh, a perfect place for a church plant. So we read in Acts chapter 11, 19, Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the wor word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So, when the Jews first came to Antioch, they pretty much kept to themselves until Greek-speaking Jews who had come to the area from Cyrene and Cyprus began to speak to the Greeks. They moved into Antioch, and they noticed all the, the Greek-speaking people there that were non-Jewish, and they, they began to have a heart for them, and they began to speak to them and, and share with them the goodness of the gospel, the good news about Jesus. And in the formation of this church, we see that God used the adversity of what happened with the persecution in Jerusalem to get these new people out of their comfort zones and to bring them to a place of new growth and new purpose. And it's not that the Jerusalem church was bad. See, it was just that the people that made up the Jerusalem church were getting used to living in the blessings of that particular community and they needed to be pushed out of their nest so to speak, so that the gospel could be established in other places. So all these people had been pushed out of their nests, out of their comfort zones, and they came to Antioch um, not knowing what was going to happen in their lives. And I'm certain that this would not be easy. If you've ever been, un if you've ever been unseated from a place or you've, you've had to leave a place and had to come somewhere else, many of you are from different places, you've come here. It's not always easy to establish yourself in a new community. There's many, many difficulties, and sometimes people leave where they're from because of adversity. I'm sure their faith was tested in Antioch as they stepped into this new place, a new culture, a new city. And sometimes we get comfortable where we are, and we begin to turn inward, and we begin to try and build something for ourselves. And God just needs to break that. And He takes us and He puts us into new places. He brings us to new places where we experience new connections, new things that we learn are, are put before us. And God, God speaks to us in new and fresh ways. And He asks us to express gifts Maybe that He's given us in different ways than we're used to. 
When God wants to do a great work in a certain vicinity, He always prepares the ground for it first, and then He strategically places His people in that place along with their various giftings to start the work and to build His church strong. Now, I think it's noteworthy that the church in Antioch started growing as the gospel was being proclaimed through ordinary people like you and me. I don't know if you caught that in the first part of the text that we read, but the Word of God went out from the ordinary people, and things started to happen. God began to bless what they put their hands to. He began to bless them as they went out and as they they told the message to the people in their community about the gospel. He began to bless it, and he was well pleased with it. Now, when they first started, they didn't know, like the Jews that, that came there, they didn't know necessarily how to even relate to these pagans that they were living amongst. They didn't know that culture. It was completely foreign, this pagan culture where they worshipped all these other gods. You know, some, we get set into cultures sometimes that we don't understand. But you see, God sees those people out there. He sees them and He loves them. And He wants them to come to a saving knowledge of Him. He, he loves them so much. And He calls His church to be a light shining in the darkness. And He makes a way for... Uh, for us to be able to reach into this dark world. And you know how He does it? Through common people. He brings common people with different gifts. And there are some of us that understand things that others of us don't. And God brings them in so that they become part of one body. And there's, there's shared information. There's teaching that occurs. And we begin to, to see how, how God um, does does His work out there in the streets, in the far corners of our, our community and, and beyond. And <laughs> you see, when these Greek-speaking believers obeyed the Lord and they, they came from, from Cyprus and, and, and they, they came to Antioch, They were following a directive by God because God knew that they would be able to help the church in Antioch be established. And gladly, these new Jewish believers who were familiar with the Greek and Roman culture and spoke the language, they chose to lay aside their own cultural prejudices and biases against those pagans to minister amongst them. And as a result, we see that the church had an impact where they were planted. Antioch, um, the dark place that it was, had this bright light shining. And in verse 21, we see that the Lord was with them. And a great number of people believed and placed their faith in the Lord. And we continue reading in Acts chapter 11, 22. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad, and he encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. So news of what God started to do in Antioch spread around, and it reached the ears of the other apostles that were in Jerusalem at the time. So they saw a need to send someone there to encourage the work that was going on. And a growing church needs good, strong leadership. So so the Jerusalem church appointed Barnabas, whose actual name means son of encouragement, to go to Antioch and to see what was going on. And when he arrived, he did not primarily mention all of the good work that the men and women in the Antioch church were doing. That's not what he said. That's not what he noted. Although that was happening, there's no doubt that people were participating in what was happening there. But but Barnabas saw something else. When he arrived, he saw what the grace of God had done. What the grace of God had done. 
You see, people, we can't do the work of the Lord without the Spirit of God on us, without the Spirit of God working through our lips, through our hands, taking our feet to the places where they need to be at the time they need to be. If we want to see a church established and a healthy church, we need to rely on the Lord and we need to recognize that our strength comes from the Lord. It is from Him. It is resident in Him. So, you know, I was thinking about this. You can turn any local church into an institution without the hand of the Lord. And if you play it right, according to business rules, and you do it just right, you pay attention to the color of your walls and the carpet and the sound, all that stuff, right? You can grow a church in numbers without the hand of the Lord. You can turn a church into a personality cult with a great leader who's skilled in how he leads without the hand of the Lord and see growth in numbers. You can turn a church into a political platform rally without the hand of the Lord and see a growth in numbers. You can turn a local church into a center for entertainment without the hand of the Lord and see growth in numbers. You can turn the church, local church into a social club that has exclusive people, members, that only focus on one another without the hand of the Lord and see growth in numbers. But the reality is this, and this is something I believe God wants us to get as a church that's rising right now. Like our church, God is doing good things here. But it's very, very important to us, for us to understand that you cannot have a healthy church, a healthy disciple-making community without the hand of the Lord. And you most certainly cannot turn people to the Lord without the hand of the Lord upon you. So here we are, God. This is a template that you've laid down in the book of Acts for future churches. We're one of them. We're one of those churches. So we, we need to pay attention to this. Antioch was not a personality cult. It wasn't a political rally, a center for attain, entertainment. It wasn't a social club and all these things. It was more than that. It was a spearhead for the move of the Holy Spirit that was changing lives and turning people from darkness into light. And Barnabas arrived and he saw what the grace of God had done. And he was overjoyed by what he saw taking place. And he encouraged all the people. How did he encourage them? He encouraged them to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. Friend, friends, in application, these Bible stories are meant to show us something about the character of God and how he works with his people. If we want to see the church here in Hundred Mile House become an Antioch-like church, we have to pay attention to what's written here. See, hardship had stripped the Antioch people that were gathering of their comforts. But one thing is, when our comforts are stripped away and we're just taken to the very stump, you ever felt like God's trim you right down to the stump. I know I have. You know, over the last number of years, many of us have felt trimmed. See, God loves us. And He says for us to treat hardship as discipline. So when the hand of God disciplines us, rather than recoiling and getting angry, He wants us to turn to Him and say, Lord, help us. Have mercy upon us, God. We need to be people after your heart. We need to know who you are and what you desire, God. And forgive us, Lord, for doing things our own way and help us to see things your way and do things your way. See, many of us here have been stripped down to stump. But God wants to grow new things in and through you. 
And his desire is that you are a church that bears much good fruit. The fruit of righteousness on every believer hanging from the boughs of our lives. So that when, when people see the church in 100 Mile and this branch of it here, that they see the fruit of the Holy Spirit hanging heavy on each person that's part of that assembly. And that is what brings health to a church because the Spirit of God is free to do what He wills in and amongst those people. Barnabas was a good leader. He was a good man in the eyes of God, and he helped the Antioch church with its mission. Leaders in the local assembly today, there's many of us here that are leaders. God wants us to have a Barnabas heart. He desires that. Paul the Apostle outlines what God desires in the heart of leaders. In 2 Corinthians 4, 1-2, later on in his ministry to the Gentiles, Paul says of himself and his leadership team, including Barnabas, he said this, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the Word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Did you hear that? That's the call to leadership. He wants us to renounce secret and shameful ways and to, and, and to be faithful in the teaching and the, and the presentation of the Lord's Word in a way that is in the correct context, in a way that honors the Lord's purpose. So very soon, after his arrival in Antioch, we see Barnabas. <laughs> He's like, God, I see your grace at work in these people. Oh, thank you, Lord. And he began to work with the people. And then the, the further people started to come to know Christ. And it just started growing more and more, growing healthy. And, and Barnabas saw the potential for great things in the kingdom of God through these people. And he saw that there needed to be more leadership to help continue building the work there. So he made this part of his mission while he was there. Barnabas sought out qualified help, qualified in the eyes of the Lord, help. It wasn't that he was sorting through a pile of resumes on his desk going, yeah, this guy looks pretty good. That guy looks... No. He was like, God, you have someone that you want to bring here to help in what is going on. And you know exactly who that person is. So who is it, Lord? Acts chapter 11, 25, we read this. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. So the name Christian came from this place. So Barnabas and, and Saul, otherwise known as the Apostle Paul, met with the church. Barnabas knew that God had called Saul to be part of what God was trying to do in Antioch. So Paul came, and they met with the church, and the two of them together taught great numbers of people over the span of a year. And after seeking or seeing the pagan Gentiles in Antioch come to know Jesus, they uh, sat with the people in the church and began to disciple them. See, when Jesus calls people to himself, he's not just calling people for a one-time thing, to purchase fire insurance. You know, although, yes, we're saved from the fires of hell, when we come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior, he saves us and delivers us from eternal death. This is what salvation is all about. But, 
But that's not where it stops. You see, sometimes people kind of look at their Christianity as this is a good fire insurance policy. You never know. You might need it someday. And that's how they view it. Rather, what God, what Jesus wanted for his followers to do was to go and make disciples. Making disciples is what the church is primarily all about. Because disciples glorify God. They become part of His family. And God desires for people to know who He is and know who they are uh, before each other and who they are before Him. He desires this earnestly. And that's why He sends us out. So that we can be part of His work in making disciples. The world needs a certain kind of church. You say, well, why does the world need the church? Guess why? You are the light of the world. Why? Because God has made His light to shine within you so that you are a beacon and a beacon of His light out there in the darkness. Isn't it dark out there right now? Everywhere you look, it's dark. The world doesn't need another church that focuses in on comforts and blessings for themselves. The world needs a church living in the stream of the life-giving power of God. A church of genuine blood-bought and cleansed saints. Bought by the blood of Jesus that was shed for them. Who come to believe in their God and trust in their God to help them to establish His kingdom and to build His kingdom through them. That's why the Lord's Prayer is so powerful. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And what is the will of God on earth as it is in heaven? To see sinners come to repentance and to be saved, delivered, and healed and brought to be at one with their God. That's what it's all about. <laughs> An Antioch church prays in one accord with one voice, with faces turned to heaven. An Antioch church is not self-focused. It's other-centered. It's Christ-centered. And as a result of the Lord's blessing on what was going there, the Antioch church became one of the greatest churches in the history of the entire church. And it's used as a template for healthy churches in the book of Acts. It was established as a base of evangelism operations into the Gentile world. And this is where believers were called Christians. And Christian means Christ-like one. Did you know they were known as Christ-like ones? Christ-like ones. I want, to, I want to ask here today, are you a Christ-like one? I pray that you are. I, I know that we're being sanctified, we're being changed, and we're being, we're being taught, and we're advancing in this way, but God wants us to seek to be like Him, to love Him so much that we want to be like our dad, our daddy, Abba, Father. We want to be like God, not like Him in His position, but like Him in His character, to be holy as He is holy as a pastor of this church here in this tiny little hamlet of 100 Mile, I mean, we're just a little tiny speck on the globe. That's okay. God has a purpose for this church here, just like He did there in that city of 500,000. He still has a purpose for us here. I, I pray. I pray that we are an Antioch church. I've got no interest in leading a church that's an entertainment hub. I'm sorry, I've got no interest in that. I'll quit tomorrow if that's what it is. I've got no interest in it. No social clubs, no political rallies. I want to see our church Christ-centered, centered on Jesus Christ and Him crucified and the gospel that sets people free. God calls us to be an Antioch church, a church that's giving, a church that's sending, a church that's disciple-making, a church that participates with the Spirit of the living God and changing lives. 
This church that is a spearhead for evangelism for the sake of God's glory and the establishment of His kingdom. <laughs> the story of Antioch continues in Acts 13. Now, the church at Antioch, at the, in the church in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Sim, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manon, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. When a church starts to get healthy, God establishes people in that assembly who have different ministry gifts, who are part of His big plan. You know, it's... It was the common people who loved the Lord and who saw those Gentiles out there that needed Jesus. It was the common people that just shared, their, shared the bread of life that what, what they'd been given, they shared it with others, and others came to know Him. You know, I've said this before, it, it, it's simply this. As a servant of the Lord, you're a beggar that's found the bread supply, and you're simply showing the other beggars where to find it. That's as simple as it is. We need God. We need the bread of life. And He offers it freely. And we partake of it. And He just wants us to hand it out. And He wants to prepare us to hand it out. He wants us to be effective in handing it out. And that's where disciple-making comes in. That's why Paul and Barnabas were appointed by the Lord to spend time with this church on its inception. So that these people would be effective disciple-makers. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, it says in verse 2, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Okay. I know that we can gloss over this, but there's something very key in here. If we want to be an Antioch church, and I know that God desires us to be an Antioch church, we have got to be a church that prays and fasts. For us to know the will of God for every person here, God has got a call on each and every person here to be a part of His kingdom. You are the body of Christ, and every one of you is a member of the body of Christ. Each of you has been called to a certain thing that God desires for you to be involved in His kingdom work in. Did you know that? You're not some obscure person that doesn't mean anything. The Lord God, the Lord your God formed you in the womb and He's counted every hair on your head and He knows you by name. The God of the universe knows you and He loves you and He calls you to be involved with His work. Maybe you don't understand exactly what that's going to look like. That's okay. For each and every one, horse. But for us to know the will of God for each and every one, for us to be able to be a giving and ascending church like the Antioch church, what we desire, we need to be people that are praying and fasting. In James 1.27, we're also told what the church's mandate is. And not only does He want us to be praying and fasting, but He wants us to be worshiping. We need to worship the Lord. And worship, the, worship of the Lord is more than what we had here this morning. That's part of it. But it's more than that. Yes, we worship the Lord with our voices and singing on Sunday morning. But the worship of God is an everyday thing. The worship of God is a lifestyle that happens each day of the week. James 1.27 says this. What is... What is what is our objective? What does God call us to as religious people? Yeah, we don't like to call ourselves religious because we have a relationship, but what God, can, what God considers as pure religion is this. James 1.27 says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And Jesus said in John 4.23, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. 
God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. So in fulfilling our mandate, God wants us to recognize that we can't do it on our own. It's not that we're to be philanthropists just going out there in the flesh doing good things. Yes, we're to do good things, but we're to do good things, first of all, recognizing this is an act of worship to God because God so loved those people, therefore our heart is pulled to them because God's heart is pulled to them. That's why we do good works. And that's why an Antioch church looks for places where people are hurting, looks for places where people need rescuing, and meets the need, and also is holy. Paul said in Romans 12, 1 to 2, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Listen to this now. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. This morning, saints gathered at Hillside, saints that are watching this broadcast on the internet, is your life a life of worship to God? Or has it become something else? I need to ask this question. And I think we should, we'd be wise to ask it daily. Is, is my life truly invested in the kingdom of God? Or is it invested in other things? Have I committed to renouncing secret and shameful ways? Friends, our church experience has to be just more than, than personal spiritual growth. Yes, it's important for us to grow spiritually, personally. But it's got to be more than that. Personal spiritual growth for the sake of consuming is not pleasing to the Lord. It's not. God has called us to pursue our relationship with Him and spiritual growth so that we can become like Him and we can be servants and witnesses. God wants us to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, as an act of worship to Him. You know what that means? If something is interfering with that, you need to get rid of it. Is there something in your life that's holding you captive? Get rid of it. God's given you His grace and He's given you freedom. He wants you to be holy as He is holy. Get rid of the things that so easily entangle every person. All of us are sinners. We can be entangled Someone wants to start bashing someone at coffee, say, listen, I'm not interested in that, and walk away. No, don't let it go. There's so many different ways. See, God doesn't want us to be unholy. He wants us to be holy. Why? Because He loves us. He wants what's best for us. He wants what's best for you, and He wants what's best for the church, and He wants what's best for this church to be His light in this community. Amen. <sighs> I went off a little track. And I'm going to close it at that. I could speak another 15 minutes, but I think what God wants here, my friends, is for us to humble ourselves before Him to recognize His call on us to be an Antioch church. And if we need to repent of stuff that we're doing wrong, today is the day. Over the next while, something that God's really laid on, on my heart is that we need to be in corporate prayer. So, 
starting the second Sunday in February, Sunday evening at 7 o'clock, we're going to call a prayer meeting here at church. I'm inviting you all to come to corporately pray for what God would have us to do and to be for Him. And if you've got prayer requests that you would like to be added to, I'm going to make up a prayer sheet. And if you've got prayer requests that you'd like to be added to that, just fire me an email on the admin uh, hillside email page. Uh, page. Just give me an email, explain what it is that you want on there, and we'll pray as a church, collectively. And we're going to target certain things that we focus in on. And once a month, I believe God's calling us to have corporate prayer, because we don't want anything to do with building this place on the wrong foundation. I'm sorry. I, I have had it with stuff that's not right. I just, I want to see God's church be the church that the Bible says that we should be for the glory of God. And I just, I desire for each one of you as people that are attending here to be able to live your life in the fullest potential that God has given you to live. 